Hi, guys. Um, welcome back for another episode. We're at episode three right now. It's going so fast. Um, and I am, I just want to say that I'm having such a good time with uh, recording these episodes and organizing them and playing them. Uh, today, we're going to talk about addiction. And the reason I chose this episode, this subject for this episode right now is might be confusing to some of you guys because I smoke weed on this podcast. Uh, this is a very 420 friendly um, podcast. And I know that for a lot of people, alcohol, narcotics, and weed fall into marijuana fall into the same category. Um, for me personally, that's not the case. I do want to preface and I do want to clarify that I it is completely possible to develop an addiction to marijuana. Uh, as human beings, we are capable of developing addictions to anything that 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 either gives us serotonin or um, hides other other things. Um, however, with the most known substances that people tend to get addicted to, there's also um, a level of co uh, dependency that uh, comes with it. Um, and I think um, it is a very much asked question that I get when I talk about addiction, where people go, oh, but how do you know? How do you recognize? I think that is the biggest problem. The biggest mistake that a lot of people make is that they think that there is a copy-paste applicable to all way that addiction looks and addiction looks differently for everybody because some people go oh um well i'm still able to hold down a job so i'm not addicted or I, all my bills are paid so i'm not addicted or i'm able to maintain my relationships i'm able to go out socially and you know i'm so i'm not an addict and some people go oh i don't need it every day so i'm not an addict i don't have withdrawals um so i'm not an addict um and I think that's also why I want to talk about this, because this rhetoric, because this way of thinking about what addiction is and what addiction isn't, makes it so that there are a lot of people who are currently definitely developing a problem, already having a problem, that don't think that they do, because they don't fit the, the stereotypical um, look of addiction. Um, another reason I want to, there's another reason for the timing of this episode, and that is because uh, it's January, and I've been seeing on social media that in droves, I see people my age, and also people younger than me, who um, talk about wanting to do dry January, and that's great. Um, however, I also see a lot of people admitting and making jokes about oh this is going to be such a big issue for me it's going to be such a challenge february 1st i need to be hospitalized because i'm going to be binge drinking i need to catch up i'm going to say this and i don't care how you feel about it i don't care if you disagree with it i don't care if it offends you because what i'm saying is factual if the idea of going a month without alcohol for you is a problem, is a challenge, you might want to take a closer look in what substances, what kind of place they hold in your life. For the simple reason that that's not normal. We have created a society that is literally, alcohol is ingrained in, in, in us as a society. So many things are either expected to, to, to include alcohol or it's almost a necessity. Where I know for a lot of people, drinking alcohol is just a part of their life. Um, and let's not forget that alcohol is not something you need. So alcohol is always, it's, it's literally, feeling drunk is literally because alcohol is a fucking toxin that you ingest willingly. So I want to say that, right? Understanding that it is very ingrained in a lot of people's lives. I get that. We're not being sensitive to that, though, because that pussyfooting around, oh, yeah, but if I drink three out of the seven days, right, because you go for drinks with friends on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and then the entire weekend is filled with brunch and clubbing, and, and these all, these, all your activities like that involve alcohol, 
That's not normal. I don't care how much it is ingrained in your life. I don't care. That's not why we're talking about this. We're not talking about this and I'm not bringing up the subject of substance abuse and alcohol and addiction to make people comfortable. I don't care that it makes you uncomfortable. Honestly, this is a subject that is, that is, it's not a bad thing for this to make you uncomfortable. Um, it is just, an, bad is not the word I like to use, but it's, it's less optimal if you choose to feel, recognize that uncomfortability, that discomfort that you're feeling about the subject and not, and because of that turning away from it. Being uncomfortable is fine, especially when we're talking about difficult, sensitive subjects and we're talking about things that might hit home for some of you guys. Un discomfort is not a bad thing. Discomfort is just something that we experience when we're not, when with specific situations that are different for every single person, right? Okay, so the other part of why I want to dedicate an episode to addiction is because I myself am a recovering addict. And um, I think it's maybe a good idea to get into that first. Uh, I have to pull up my snap memories because due to the... Um, yeah, part of my life where I was doing a lot of drugs. Um, my I have sustained brain damage um, that I'm getting treated for um, because of this. Um, and I think that's also why I think I am maybe not the perfect, but I'm definitely a good, ex good like I'm a great person to talk about this. I'm a great person when it comes to talking about this because... My addiction was never, quote unquote, that bad. It was never to the outside world, especially to other people. It was never that bad. It was just, I very much fitted into that party girl aesthetic because at the time I was working as an escort and within the agency that I worked for, I was the youngest and I was the only one that never had kids. And because of that, I very much fell into the party girl category. And because I was not against using narcotics while I worked, I would get booked for that reason by a lot of clients because they knew that I would use drugs with them. I didn't mind at the time because then you have a dude that's like pushing 50. I'm walking in. He's asking me, oh, do you mind if I do a line? And I immediately know, okay, that means that you are one, going to lose track of time. And two, I'm not going to have to do anything because your equipment will not be working after the second line. You know what I mean? Um, so that's, that's kind of where it, where, what made it worse. I think what really sped it up for me, that is where, that is where I was at my life. That's where it all started. Um, I was working as an escort and that's kind of how the drug, um, have really developed. I'm trying, I'm scrolling through my gallery right now to see when this was. I know that this was definitely during COVID and I know I'm not the only one in this where, when I say that COVID was detrimental to my substance use because all of a sudden I was sitting inside with nothing to do and I would just hang out with people on the internet and it really started during COVID um, for me. So I think the story of how it initially started, I'm still scrolling, I'm so bad at this, um, how it initially started is going to sound very recognizable to a lot of people. Um, let's say June, 2021 around that time, kind of where it started. Um, and it started out with once every, every, every once in a while. Um, and then I used to have these house parties with my brother and, um, just pause. I know some of y'all might think, uh, me mentioning my brother this carelessly, and I'm going to be bringing up his addiction as well. I have no loyalty. I have no, um, yeah, I don't care. I don't care. Like if any of my family sees this, if my brother sees this, I, I don't care. I don't care how he feels about me bringing this up. I don't care about how he feels about me mentioning this. And when I'm done telling my, my addiction story, I think you guys understand why I have no, um, yeah, no remorse towards that. Um, so yeah, that's how it started. We, um, we would have these house parties and, um, yeah, at first it was like once in a while. And then that's always how it would go. We would get really, really drunk 
And then all of us would just either do ketamine or uh, it's called meow. But I think it's called 4-MMC, meth- methadrone with pH, not meth, methadrone with pH. Um, and it's, it's just, it's one of those designer drugs. It's one of those like European party drugs. Um, when it comes to the effect of what it feels like, I compare it to usually it feels like MDMA, but it works in the time frame of Coke. Um, so I think you can imagine why it is such a popular, um, party drug, uh, but because it's a designer drug and, uh, people tend to, um, change some of the components in it. It is really an unsafe and very, very unsafe and a very, very dangerous drug to be using. And it's a very popular thing, uh, right now amongst a lot of young people. That's beside the point. Um, so now looking back at that i see that progression very clearly where at first it was like once in a while and then we get a little bit and it wasn't anything too crazy and then after a few weeks after a few parties we would already know right at the beginning of the night we would start preparing for when so we would start getting we would start drinking earlier so we get fucked up faster so that we could start doing drugs sooner because that's usually how we would go we would drink until we were too fucked up to still party and then we would start doing drugs to sober us up so we could keep going um so that went on for a few months and then so i had now two elements where the house parties which was almost every weekend um, and then I had my escort gigs where I would do drugs almost every appointment. And it's really hard to recognize that you're not, that this is a problem and this is not a good thing that you're doing. When my bank account was fucking busting at the seams because I was coming home every single night with, or at least a lot of nights with like seven or 800 euros in my pocket cash. However, that would also mean that nine out of 10 times I would have been up for the past six, seven hours doing cocaine in some random dude's jacuzzi. And I know that doesn't sound like, like it's bad because we have this glorified idea of, of, of there's this class issue with, with addiction and with drug use. Right. Um, but that's not good. That's not good. Cause then I would come home on Thursday nights. I would come home on a ter- Thursday night or Friday night, 6 AM, give or take sometimes eight, sometimes nine. Then I would go to bed or I wouldn't go to bed because I was still fucked up and I would have to stay awake all day. And then that next day I would have to work again, um, do the exact thing all over again. So what that would usually look like, I knew that I wouldn't be able to go to sleep. So I would come home and I would hop on discord and discord for me during COVID was completely took over my social life. And then I found a lot of people on discord that were also doing drugs. So we would just hang out all night well into the morning and just do drugs together. And then it was really funny with the time zones that the Americans would go to sleep and then I would still be up. It would be like nine, eight, nine AM here. And then the Australians would hop on and then I would literally be crackhead activities, cleaning my house, uh, blasting fucking EDM, blasting fucking hard style, hardcore terror music, and then just like clean my entire house. Um, So that's usually what that would look like in the beginning. And then after a while, I, drugs was all like my addiction and drug, my drug habit and doing drugs was now just a part of my life. It was just a thing that I did. And for example, if I had like, uh, I had pulled an all nighter for like the third time that week, what would happen is that I, I would, uh, this is what it would kind of look like. I would have been on discord all night doing lines with God knows who. And then I would, uh, you know, sun would be coming up. It would be getting light. I'm like, okay, I need to like go to the store or some shit. I need to like get cigarettes. That was usually the case. I have to get cigarettes. And then I do a line before going to the supermarket because I knew that I would be coming down if I didn't do that. So it was a very, very panicked, very stressful, very anxiety filled moment in the supermarket because I wanted to get home as fast as I could because I, I was in the beginning, I didn't take the drugs with me because I was so scared that I would either get caught taking them in public or I would get arrested or something would happen. And then I would, you know, I would have drugs on me in public. I didn't like that. I didn't want to take that risk. So I would do a line, go to the supermarket and then come back. I laugh. I, I laugh and I giggle at it now because that is insane. That's an insane way to live. And I honestly didn't see, at the time, I didn't see the problem in it as much as I obviously recognize now. Um, 
So that that's kind of the phase where it started developing and it started becoming a real part of my life. And then after a while, I kept going to Amsterdam because in Amsterdam, the party doesn't stop. So I could just be fucked up for three days with random ass people. And no one would question it. No one would... I don't know. And I, I loved the way that I felt when I was in Amsterdam. I loved the way people treated me. I felt so cool. I felt so special. And when I was like, I, I was never a cool, popular person when I was in all throughout my, my school years, I've been bullied heavily. And even like now I don't like, I'm not, you know, I don't make friends easy. People don't tend to like think that I'm like cool, popular, whatever. Um, so that was what I was supposed to walk away from. That's what, like, I never, you know, so I really wanted to, to keep that. That's, that's, it made sense to me to, to do what I did. Um, and I think that after a while, it really just started to become an actual problem to the sense where I would wake up, I would sleep in and not show up for, for my shifts. I would, I would, my driver would be at the door ringing. My boss would be calling and I would be asleep in my bed. Cause I literally, I would stay up for three days. I would stay up for three days and then sleep for like 12 hours and then do the whole thing again. So I think that something that we don't talk about enough is the fact that drug abuse and addiction is partly very much a class issue. And what I mean by that is that I, I was able to maintain my addiction. I was able to, to function, right? Because I had a lot of money. So I never had to worry about dealing with withdrawals if I had them at all, because I had all the, I, I never ran out of drugs. So I would stay up for three days and then I would stay up for three days doing drugs. I would sleep for 12 hours. Then I'd have a window where I was sober for a few hours. And then I start using again. Um, so I think that's also something that we, like, if you're, if you don't have the money and you're dealing with an addiction, you're also going to go through a lot of withdrawals because you don't have the money. You also don't have the privilege, privilege, the luxury. Let me put it like that. Cause privilege is not the luxury to assure that you always have good quality narcotics that aren't cut or laced with anything because you can't, you just have to get what you get because you can't afford it. Um, I think that, uh, so not last New Year's, not the New Year's before, the New Year's before that, right? I, so the New Year's of 2020, 2021 to 2022, um, I passed out and I woke up on the bathroom floor because I don't, so for context, I don't speak to my family anymore, it was going to be difficult for me. Um, so instead of dealing with that in a healthy way, I just spent three days not sleeping and not being sober. Um, that was a conscious choice that I made, which those were just the choices I made at the time. Um, and when I passed out in the shower, I passed out on my bathroom floor. That's, um, I think that was, uh, definitely a pinnacle moment of how bad it had gotten. And this is a very much like an addict thing where you think listening to this now that this is what rock my rock bottom was. And I turned my life around and no, 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 <laughs> that was not my rock bottom. My rock bottom would not happen for a few, few more months because as an addict, that is why addiction is an illness and why addiction is so difficult to deal with when you're in it and to recognize it when you're in it, because you start addiction is in control of your thoughts now. So you start justifying things in your head in the weirdest way possible where, where, um, I, I didn't in that me passing out in the bathroom didn't make me go, Oh, I should stop doing drugs. It made me go, I should stop doing, I should start doing drugs differently. So what I did is I made all these rules in my head where I was like, Oh, if I'm going to do drugs, I need to, um, make sure I, I drink water and I need to make sure that I eat, even though I hate eating when I'm high. Right. So I did that. And the only thing that did is prolong the point I needed to get to, to want to stop and get better and get sober because now I could party for longer and get fucked up for longer and stay fucked up for longer. And I, cause now all of a sudden the dehydration and, and the headaches and that it w it wouldn't be, 
it wouldn't happen anymore. Um, so I think I, I, I don't have a wake up call moment. I don't, don't, I didn't have it. My wake up call moment was the reason I got sober is because my best friend went to rehab and I didn't want to trigger him. I still wanted to be able to spend time with him and hang out with him. So I was like, if you're going to go to rehab and you're going to get sober, I'm going to quit cold Turkey and I'll be sober by the time that you get out. And then we'll both be sober. That didn't go as planned. I struggled. I still struggle with my sobriety. I still struggle with not relapsing. And if you were to ask me right now, how long I've been sober, I don't know. I want to say three months. Um, but I think that is giving myself too much credit. I have, I am still very much struggling, um, with my sobriety. And for me, marijuana, besides all the mental health stuff that I smoke marijuana for, um, speaking of which, (laughs) um, me dealing with my, uh, sobriety and, and trying to stay sober is also definitely, um, a reason why I smoke as much marijuana as I do. And also just like, it's really fucking fun. And like I mentioned in the beginning, I do want to show sympathy and be sensitive towards the fact and let you guys know that if you're hearing me talk about addiction and you're hearing how I talk about marijuana and you think to yourself, girl, you are the biggest hypocrite I've ever met in my life. You're right. Probably. Like, I understand that you think that. However, if there's one thing I've learned about sobriety is that small victories are so important and choosing your battles and choosing the lesser evil and all that, because very simply put, I, because of a life of trauma, because of all the unresolved shit, because of all the mental health issues, I added another illness to my repertoire, which is addiction. And that is just something I have to live with the rest of my life for the rest of my life with. And it's always going to be a learning curve. When I'm 80 years old, I'm still going to have to learn new things about my addiction and have to adjust it. And I think that is also something that people don't talk about. It is like, you're only successful and it only works and it's only worth it. If you can quit cold Turkey and stay sober forever and never relapse. No, no, no. You accepting the fact that you're an addict, except is also accepting the fact that you're an addict for the rest of your life. That doesn't mean that you can't be happy. That doesn't mean that you can't be better. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean anything besides that you are an addict for the rest of your life. That is an illness that you have and not recognizing that makes it a lot harder for yourself being very, Oh, but it's not that bad. And minimizing it and invalidating yourself only makes it hard. Take it as seriously as it needs to be taken right? When I look at how normalized substance abuse is in our society, especially amongst young people, it makes me really sad and it makes me really worried because I know exactly the things that people say to each other while they're doing drugs, how they, how they justify doing drugs. But now that I am on the other end of things, right? I'm 27 now. I'm starting to actually take care of myself. I'm starting to take myself seriously. I'm starting to want things again. I'm starting to, you know, heal and grow. The attitude we have towards young people using narcotics and other substances and especially abusing narcotics and other substances is really heartbreaking to me because we don't care. That's the thing. Like we stopped caring about putting poison in our body. And I don't mean that in like a health freak type of way. Cause if you want to fucking eat McDonald's, eat McDonald's, you want to, you want to go order pizza, order pizza. But there's a difference between eating unhealthy, right? When we talk about the extent, extensive effect that has on our, on our body, on our life and drinking massive amounts of alcohol and doing, using narcotics and, I think part of that is because we we don't talk about it like drugs and drug use is still very taboo almost. Um, and because of that, there's a lack of knowledge. It's very vilified. And there's this idea, there's a stigma that people who are addicted, addicts, are lazy and have bad work ethic and are, are broken. And I'm like, hold up. I need y'all to understand. 
people that deal with mental health issues are more likely to develop uh, an addiction at some point in their life. However, every person on the planet can develop an addiction. Every There's no one that is immune. I don't care what you think about yourself. I don't care how strong-willed you are and how much discipline you have. You too can develop an addiction if you're not careful. This can be an addiction to a lot of different things, but because we're talking about narcotics specifically, because that's, you know, because that is, that is such a pit people put in the way for themselves. You are really setting yourself up with that mentality. You're like, oh, but yeah, I don't have an addictive personality. It doesn't run in my family. No, but I have a lot of discipline. No, no, and no, you're wrong. You can develop an addiction. And if you're not smart about the substances that you take in, the substances that you regularly use, especially when all of your friends also use that substance, I can fucking guarantee you, you will develop an addiction. Now, when it comes to advice, because I don't live in a fantasy world where I know that me going, don't do drugs, is going to actually make you not want to do drugs. Um, So I'm going to say a bunch of things right now that hopefully are going to make you not want to do drugs. Um... So I'm 27 and my house is currently filled with post-it notes. There is, I I bought a chalk marker to write on my kitchen cupboards, my wind, my, 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 my mirrors, everything. Um, and the reason I need to do that is because my memory is, is terrible. Um, my, like, it's actually, if I don't write it down, I do not remember. And when I say I don't write, when I don't write it down, I do remember, I don't remember. I mean that with literally everything. I have trouble remembering people's names. I have trouble remembering context of conversations. I have trouble remembering everything. And that, the brain damage that causes that, that is the reason for that, solely because of drug use. Don't get me wrong. My memory has been not optimal for a big part of my life because of unresolved trauma. Unresolved trauma has the effect of fucking with your memory. Um, But... my abuse, my drug, my drug problem has made it so that every single problem that I already had has gotten worse tremendously. And the saddest thing about it is that I have been, I think I have another month, maybe two of treatment left, but I've been going to the hospital every single week to get treatment, um, to help with the, uh, brain damage. Another thing, I sound a lot dumber than I I used to. Forming sentences, coming up with words is so much harder now for me than it used to be. And sometimes it, I wouldn't say it makes me insecure, but it makes me, it frustrates me a lot. Because I have, because that in combination with having trouble remembering stuff, having ADHD, right? having BPD, like it, it, I've, uh, the addiction and the results of that have made life tremendously harder than it already was. Um, I have scars on my face because when I, if I was really high, um, I would hyper fix it on my face. And then if I had little pimples of, or little things, I would start picking at them until there were literally patches of open just flesh just my skin was gone in certain parts and this is if you're just listening to this I'm sorry you're not gonna be able to see this um but it's you can't really see it that well but it's like mostly on my cheeks there are a lot of dark spots that's just like scarring from I have a really weird spot on my um on my stomach that don't know how how I hurt that but all I do know is that it happened while um on a bender. So, and this is, this is, this is discoloration. That's going to be there forever. Um, so yeah, that definitely, um, I have spent a lot of money. And when I say a lot of money, I mean, as in my life could look complete, could have looked completely different if I wouldn't have, um, while I was high. Um, I don't even want to calculate the amount of money I've spent on drugs, Um, and what that could have, uh, you know, it's kind of like the calculation you make when you start like adding up how much you spend on cigarettes through the years. Yeah, not, uh, not great. Um, 
my social anxiety got worse, um, where I, I have had multiple times since I've decided to get sober, um, where I was in a social setting where I ended up relapsing because I, I realized that for the past year, I had not been in social settings sober anymore ever, because that's just what my life was like. Um, so I also think it's important to mention that no matter how, what your situation was or is, you are fully responsible for everything you do all of the time. And what I mean by that is that what I had to deal with myself is me and my brother were both going through our addiction at the same time. We were both using together a lot and One day he decided to steal a thousand euros in cash from me. Um, and it's just, it was very surreal to me to, after him spending months and months of paying me back, which I need you to understand, within days of me realizing the money was gone, I had confronted him and he denied it and the money was already gone by then or so he claimed he spent months trying to pay me back and then when he did he called me and he admitted everything and he apologized that was the first time he admitted to what he did and he used that line on me where i was like yeah but you have to understand like when you're an addict you do things that you know you just oh you know you're just a different person I'm not saying that you won't, and I'm not saying that that's not true because let's be honest, addiction isn't, is an illness and it overwrites your logical thinking. I will give you, I will give people that. However, what I've noticed is that when it comes to addiction, especially in the beginning There are a lot of things that people have done to me while dealing with their addiction that I would never do to them or I have never done to other people or I have never even thought about doing in my most active addiction. And the point I'm trying to make here is that, yes, your addiction might have been the motivation and might have been the main reason why you did what you did. However, you're still you and that is still what you did. Obviously, I can fully recognize that I'm biased because of this situation, but this is also why in the beginning I said, I don't give a fuck how my brother feels about me talking about this. I don't give a fuck how any of my family feels about me talking about this because they were simply not there. They chose not to be there for me. When I call my parents about to tell them, hey, how do I fucking deal with this situation? Because my brother, your son, just stole a thousand bucks in cash from me. The response I got from my dad was... Well, you know how he is. I don't understand why you would trust him in your house knowing that he can't be trusted. So when I think about the downfall of my relationship with my family, a lot of people immediately assume that because I do sex work and because I am a recovering addict, that's why. And they immediately have this like horror story in their head of me hitting rock bottom and going to my parents and stealing their money. No, no, no. I, that's never what it was like for me. The person that suffered the most from my addiction is me. I didn't have to go on a redemption tour to apologize to a bunch of people that I fucked over when I was an addict, but I still did. Where I have definitely, there are definitely people that I apologize to because of the way I acted and the person that I was while going through my addiction, because I have done that also with friendships that I looked back on later that when I was fully sober, um, there, I, I just, I can't, I feel like there's not enough, there's nothing I can say to make you guys realize that there is nothing casual. There's nothing carefree. There's nothing easy. There's nothing simple about using narcotics. There's nothing 
fulfilling about using narcotics. If you feel the need to use narcotics, I can guarantee you that nine out of 10 times, if not a hundred percent of the time, it is, it, it, it could have been fixed with therapy. And I understand that therapy is a luxury and a privilege for a lot of people. However, on this podcast, I'm also going to be talking about a lot of free resources that I've used and I'm still using, um, because even though I live in a country where healthcare is free, our mental health system is absolutely fucked. Um, and, um, I think that's also part of the reason why I I'm doing this podcast because I think that a lot of us don't realize that there is so much more and there is so much better available. So we go to things that numb the pain and make us not feel what we have to feel. Um, because also all the reasons that you got in your head right now to justify your usage, to justify why, to justify, right? Lies. They're all lies. If I ask you, why are you drinking tonight? Why are you drinking every single night? And you, every, whatever reason you're giving me right now that pops into your head. If I ask you, why are you doing Coke every single weekend? I don't care about what the reasoning is. You are choosing to put poison and chemicals in your body. And I understand that immediate reaction when you are on the other side of this to go, (laughs) okay, lame. Cause that was me. That's what I used to do. And I'm always going to be understanding for your need to cope with life. I'm always going to be empathetic, sensitive, and understanding towards your, the way you cope, especially if these are coping skills that are mostly toxic to you and not so much toxic to other people. However, I want you to do better. I want you to want to do better. Um, And I don't care how long it takes for you to be better. I just need you to want it. You don't have to get there in one step. You don't have to, you don't have to, I don't, I don't care how much you, how many times you fall on your ass. I don't care how many times you relapse. I don't, I don't care about any of that. I just care about you wanting to be better. I care about you looking at your life and thinking that you deserve more and you deserve better than this existence that you can't fucking remember that you can't process correctly because you're fucked up all the time. Um, so I think I was aiming for an episode that was kind of like more educational, but it ended up being a lot more personal, which, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a little scary because a lot of my friends and a lot of the people that I've, I've interacted with, I've spoken to in the last two years know about this part of my life, but I have never in really great detail talked about my addiction story um like this and post it in a way where it's permanent um but if i want to run a platform that is all about having no shame and is all about celebration of vulnerability and is all about supporting each other judgment free and being productive and building each other up. If that's community I'm trying to build, I have to lead by example. So that's what I'm doing. And I love that this podcast, even though I am, I don't have shame. I think it's a ridiculous notion. And I am a pretty confident person. I still struggle with putting these things on the internet. So I'm really, I'm really glad that this podcast is also kind of a challenge to me and, and kind of forces me to, I don't know, step out of my comfort zone. And the fact that I still had one, um, is, is interesting. Yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I would love to hear what you guys thought of it. So if you had any thoughts, hop over to the Instagram, um, of the podcast, shame is overrated at shame is overrated pod or shame is overrated podcast. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I, um, am enjoying it. And before I go, you guys might want to follow the Instagram at regardless, because I will be announcing, um, the guests that is going to join me on the last episode of this month. That's going to be the fifth episode that's going to air on the 29th, Monday, the 29th, um, So I'll be dropping little hints, little Easter eggs uh, on the Instagram on which guest that will be. Um, And I will see you guys next time.